Welcome to this lecture on Thomson scattering. In this video, we will understand the process by which photons scattered off of charged particles, derive a cross-section for this interaction, and consider some important places where we see the effects of Thomson scattering in astronomy. So to start, what is Thomson scattering? The two pieces we need here are a charged particle, such as an electron, and a photon. Now, we know that a photon is actually just oscillations of electric and magnetic fields propagating through a vacuum together as a plane wave, but for the purposes of this derivation, we will only consider the interaction between the electron and the E field. The electric field component of the plane wave will accelerate the electron, and as we've seen with the Larmor formula, accelerated charged particles radiate. Specifically, they radiate with a power two-thirds times the charge squared times the acceleration squared divided by the speed of light cubed. And let's also write down an expression for the electric field inducing this acceleration. E is equal to E naught sine of omega t in the z direction, assuming that the wave we've drawn here is propagating in the x direction. Now, we're going to do two things with this uh, information we have here. First, we're going to write down an equation of motion for the electron. So uh, the force on the electron is going to be due to the electric field, so that force is given by E, E naught, uh, sine of omega t, and we set that equal to mass times acceleration. So if we write this out in terms of acceleration, we have that the acceleration is equal to charge times E naught divided by the mass of the electron, um, times sine of omega naught t. So with this acceleration, let's get an RMS acceleration, which is just the square root of the average of the square of the acceleration. And that's going to end up being equal to the charge times the magnitude of the electric field divided by the mass of the electron times the square root of 2. And where that square root of 2 is coming from is just that if you look at sine squared, uh, which is the first part of taking RMS, and look at the average, it's right about one half, so the square root of that is one over square root two. So, moving on, we can also solve the equation of motion for our electron. So just integrating this twice, this expression for z, uh, we can get that uh, the position of the electron is the charge times e naught divided by omega naught squared times the mass times a sine of omega naught t. So this equation of motion shows that the electron is oscillating back and forth along the electric component of the plane wave. And this can be interpreted as an oscillating electric dipole with a moment given by the charge times the separation, which ends up being this expression we've already seen here with an additional e um, and in the direction of motion. And as we know, oscillating electric dipoles radiate. So this is consistent with what we have so far. So I'm going to mark both of these because we're going to come back to them later. So now we have a sense of the interaction that's going on. Let's try to find a cross section for this interaction. So we can do this nice little trick where we write down the differential power scattered into a solid angle. And we can rewrite this power dp d omega as being dp d sigma times d sigma d omega. Now, you might notice that the dp d omega term is just pointing flux, power radiated through an area, right? And we've seen pointing flux. Time average pointing flux is just c e naught squared divided by 8 pi. And the other little fancy thing we can do is cross out both of the d omegas. So now, if we substitute and integrate, we have that the power is equal to c e naught squared divided by 8 pi times our cross-section for interaction. And we can write down this cross-section for interaction, just inverting the equation. And we know that because we have an accelerating charge, this power is going to be given to us by the Larmor formula. So we can write down this sigma, is 8 pi divided by c e naught squared times the power given by the Larmor formula, 2 thirds e squared a squared, divided by the speed of light cubed. Now, we can also express the Larmor formula in terms of electric dipole moments, where the second term just becomes the dipole moment squared 
times omega naught to the fourth over c squared rather than c cubed. And if we look that up, we find that we can use either the RMS acceleration or the dipole moment that we had written down earlier in either of these expressions. And in fact, both of them will give us the same result. Uh, for the purposes of this video, I'm going to use the former and solve this in terms of the acceleration. So we get that our sigma is equal to h pi over c e naught squared times 2 thirds e squared over c cubed times the e squared from the acceleration times e naught squared over 2 mass e naught squared. And we can cancel out a bunch of these terms, uh, the e naught noughts and the 2, and we end up with the result that the cross section is equal to h pi over 3 e to the 4th over m e squared e to the 4th. Now, this quantity here is actually the square of the classical electron radius. And it might seem strange to consider an electron radius, but we can cleverly define one if we set the rest mass energy of an electron equal to the electric potential energy contained within some radius. So with this nice little definition, we can define the cross-section per interaction of Thomson scattering to be 8 pi over 3 times the classical electron radius squared, which numerically becomes 6.65 times 10 to the negative 25 centimeters squared. So at this point, I should mention the assumptions that went into the derivation. So something we did not account for were relativistic sets. So we assumed that both the electric field and the velocity of the electron were low enough that relativity isn't relevant. In a high velocity or high E field limit, we have to consider relativistic effects, and this process actually becomes Thompson scattering, which will not be talked about in this video. But for now, as long as both of these quantities are low enough, our derivation holds. So now that we've understood Thompson scattering, let's look at some places where it occurs. One important place where we see the effects of Thompson scattering is in the cosmic microwave background, or the CMB. So shortly after the Big Bang, the universe was primarily ionized hydrogen, which meant that there were free electrons and protons throughout the universe. And as we've seen already, uh, free charged particles is the main thing you need for Thompson scattering. Because of this opportunity for scattering, the universe was opaque to radiation. Any photons coming in would be scattered off an electron rather than continuing along its ray path. As the universe expanded, however, it cooled to the point at which protons and electrons combined to form molecular hydrogen, which, because it is neutrally charged, does not contribute to Thomson scattering. Without free charged particles to scatter off of, the universe became transparent to photons. The last photon scattered before this epoch of recombination formed the cosmic microwave background, which we can examine today to study the early universe. Slightly outside the realm of astronomy, Thomson scattering is also relevant in tokamaks, which are essentially giant toroids built in which to produce controlled fusion. So in a tokamak, you have a toroidal field created by electromagnets around the tokamak with a plasma inside of it, contained and heated by these magnetic fields. The power produced by a tokamak is a function of electron density. And in order to determine this electron density, one can shine a laser through the tokamak and measure the effects of Thomson scattering on this laser. So with that, you hopefully now have a better understanding of Thompson scattering. Thanks for watching.